Well, hi everyone, this is Bob the Science Guy. You know, a few years ago when I started this channel, I called it Bob the Science Guy. Well, because my name is Bob and I'm a science guy. I thought it was kind of cute to play off of Bill Nye's name too. He is aware of this channel, by the way, and I haven't received a cease and desist so far, so he must be okay with it. But if I hadn't called it Bob the Science Guy, I think I would have called it Physics for English Majors. And the reason that I would call it that is because I like to explain physics and math to people that really just don't do a lot of physics and math. I try and come up with a rather intuitive way to talk about these rather complex subjects to people that maybe don't have a lot of the technical background that people that are in the field would have. I'm also a big fan of drawings. Uh, this is my drawing from the last video where I talked about something called a Hohmann transfer. which is how you get from one orbit up to another orbit and vice versa. Today I want to talk about a subject that seems to have caused some confusion in the chat, and that is centrifugal force. Now, centrifugal force uh, is kind of a difficult thing to wrap your head around because it's not a true force. It's what's called an apparent or a pseudo force. So let's see if we can make a couple of diagrams here and see if we can kind of get a feel for what centrifugal force actually represents. Now let me show the analogy that I'm going to use, and that is Hooke's Law. So here I have a rubber band. And that rubber band, if you put no force on it, has a certain length. If you apply a force to it, such as the weight of this little bob uh, being accelerated down towards the ground by gravity, it will stretch this rubber band a little bit. Well, why doesn't it keep falling? Because the more you stretch this rubber band, the more the rubber band pulls back on the weight. So if I would stretch it a little further, what would happen? The rubber band would pull it back at a force greater than the force of gravity, and it would bounce up like that. Notice, too, that it oscillates back and forth a little bit until it gets to a balance point. Now we can look at centrifugal force in an analogous way. So let's say that we have the surface of the Earth. So let's assume a flat, non-rotating surface of the Earth. There we go. And we're going to have a cannon up here, say 150 kilometers above the surface. And that cannon is going to fire a cannonball in this direction, parallel to the surface of the Earth. Now that cannonball has mass, and it has a velocity, and it wants to continue going along that dotted line. However, right here, we have a force acting downward on it, and that force is going to be the force of gravity, mass times the acceleration of gravity. And as a result, it's going to change the vector of that cannonball a little bit. Now, let's say the vector of the cannonball is now going in that direction. And that is a direct result, this angle right here is a direct result of the downward force on the cannonball where it's fired, causing it to move from the dotted course down to the solid line course. So let's take an initial velocity of one kilometer per second. Let's say that after one second, the cannonball is now where this hash is. Now, notice that it is below this dotted line. If you were to imagine a rubber band on the dotted line attached to the cannonball down here at this sloping line, you can imagine that that cannonball is stretching that rubber band just a little bit, very much, like my plumb bob and this rubber band here. And as a result, it's applying a little bit of force in the opposite direction, just as the rubber band does. In this case, it's trying to pull the cannonball back to this dotted line. But it's just a very small force, and it's very small compared to the vector of gravity going in the other direction. As a result, the cannonball continues to go down. Well, let's go out here to about three kilometers. Now, at three kilometers a second, after one second, it'll be three kilometers out here, and you notice 
that this rubber band now is stretched a little bit more. The, however, the force that the rubber band is exerting on that cannonball, even though it's greater here than it is here, is still not as large as the force of gravity pulling it down. So the cannonball continues to go down. However, when you get out here somewhere between, we'll say that that's seven and that's eight kilometers per second, you're gonna reach a point where that rubber band has stretched enough that the force it's pulling it up exactly equals the force that's pulling it down. Now, what's gonna to happen to the cannonball? It's not here, here, and here. The force of gravity was greater than the centrifugal force pulling it up. Uh, here, this force of centrifugal force equals the force of gravity. And as a result, the cannonball will no longer go down, but instead, it will level off above the ground at a certain fixed distance. When you look at the force of gravity, what you're dealing with is mass times gravity. When you look at centrifugal force, this equivalent force right here is equal to mass times the velocity squared over the radius from the center of the Earth. Now, the take-home message here is that the velocity is on top and it's squared, which means that a relatively small change in the velocity makes a big change in the amount of centrifugal force. Now, what does this rubber band actually represent? When you move an object of mass m times a velocity v, you get something called inertia. Inertia means that this cannonball wants to continue along this dotted line, and it will resist any effort to pull it away from that dotted line. So when you apply the force of gravity to it, you're pulling that cannonball away from the dotted line, and inertia will try and pull it back towards the dotted line. It's not so much that it's pulling it back, it's resisting the movement away from it. And the further you get away, the longer this line gets, the more it resists until it actually balances the downward force with this resistance force. Now, one of the commenters brought up a very good point. Newton's first law says that a body at rest or in uniform motion will remain at rest or in uniform motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. So basically, if I have a ball and I push on it from that side, the ball is going to go that way. Okay. However, if I have this same ball and I push on it from the left and you push on it with equal force to the right, the ball will not move at all. It'll stay right there because the forces are in balance. Now, what the commenter said was that if I draw the centrifugal force opposite the force of gravity and show them to balance each other, the satellite would no longer move. Well, that's not really true because the satellite starts off at a velocity of zero and everything is pulling it down and as a result, the ball will fall down because there's nothing countering it. As we move faster, we still have this downward pull of gravity. However, centrifugal force starts to come into play. And again, it's a pseudo force and it is related to this velocity. If you don't have the velocity around the Earth, you don't have any centrifugal force. You still have gravity. But as we increase the velocity, we increase this force opposing gravity. And it gets to the point, and again, for the space station, it's uh, 7.64 kilometers per second. When it's doing that speed, it is exactly balancing the force of gravity. That means it's not getting higher nor lower. It's maintaining its altitude. It doesn't say anything about the motion in that direction. And since that altitude has to do with the distance from the center of the Earth, it forms a curved path above the curved surface of the Earth, maintaining the same distance from the radius at all points. 
So it isn't moving up and down. Uh, it's moving in a curve because the distance to the center of the Earth follows a curved path as you go around the Earth due to the velocity of the satellite. So I hope that using this little demonstration using Hooke's Law kind of gives you a little bit of insight into how centrifugal force works. This is Bob the Science Guy, or Physics for English Majors, signing out. Make sure you drop me a like and a subscribe, and if you haven't donated to the Telescope Fund, this would be a great time to do it. Take care, everyone.